Welcome, welcome, welcome to another episode of Prepper Talk Radio, Radio for the Ready Minded with your hosts, Scott, Shane, and Paris. We're here tonight to share. We're on the live. If you're listening live to us on Facebook or on, especially on YouTube, hit the like button so this goes out and uh, the algorithm catches it and, and sends it out to more folks. We're excited to share with you some thoughts and feelings about uh, some stuff today that we're going to go through. Uh, before we do that, though, jump over to PrepperTalkRadio.com and uh, fill out, uh, put your email in there on our resources page, download all of our resources so that you are prepared and ready to go with what we have available to you and get on our email list so that when we have more resources available, we know how to get a hold of you. Also, please check out Jace Medical, J-A-S-E Medical.com. They have great antibiotics over there for you with the Jace case. Also, they have daily medicines. One of the big concerns a lot of people have is what, what do we do about our medicines when the grid goes down or when crap hits the fan or anything else? So please get your supply of medicines over there. And then once you have your supply of medicines, you're good to go. Start learning skills and things to obtain better, um, better healthy things like herbs and whatnot. But use Prepper Talk as your code at Jace Medical to get $10 off. Also, make sure you go over and hit up our friend Byron over at survivalfrog.com, survivalfrog.com. They are having sales going on on all of their gear. They have actually what I actually have, uh, what we felt is some of the best canned meat. So one of the big problems out there with a lot of the food storage items is the protein content. Is uh, We just got to get that protein content. And Survival Frog has a proprietary cans of meat that they've created. They have chicken, beef shredded beef. So get your cans of protein um, and you'll get 10% off if you use code prepper talk at checkout. So hit up survivalfrog.com to get your proteins and other survival gear and a 10% off and all the sales that are having already. So you guys, today we're going to talk about um, hygiene. We're going to talk about different things that we can do to keep ourselves safe and clean and um, also how to dispose of a few things in case we need to uh, as time goes on because uh, there's some issues with uh, hygiene and disposal that we're going to need to work on, especially if we have, um, unfortunately, when we ever have civil unrest or we have a major uh, grid going, going down, there are people that um, don't make it and we need to be able to know what to do and how to take care of them. So we're going to jump in and we're going to talk about that today. So I have a question. Go. I've been waiting to ask this question all week. Why do they bury the dead six feet below? That's the top of the casket is six feet up or six feet down. Why? Six feet under. Well, you, you got to take the frost line into consideration as well as, as pests and animals and, and such. Um, Wrong. That w I was just getting started, Scott. I wasn't. No, go ahead. Tell, what is the answer? I want to hear Paris's guess. So, um, yeah. Uh, I'm going to say the guy who was supposed to dig his own grave can't see over the top and they can just uh, bury him. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe the worms can't get down that far as much. And so they, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm not going to have a good guess actually. There is zero scientific data to support why a body should be buried six feet deep. Really? That's the, the only yeah. thing I've found is that it costs more to dig six feet deep so they can charge more. To dig six feet deep. Oh, you gotta be kidding me. Historically, people would bury just below the frost line. Right, at least three feet. Right? And the right. reason was, was because they felt like if they got that deep, animals wouldn't be able to smell the carcass and come after it. Mm -hmm. That was that was why people did that. But other the six feet, like no, there's no scientific, nothing backing it up. Um, so I just wanted to give that like Give people some pause. Like when you're thinking about, okay, just I got to, I've got Grandma Fernie didn't make it through the nuke, and she, her her bypass machine or whatever she, oxygen gave out, and she didn't make it for whatever reason. Like guys, you're gonna kill yourself digging a six foot deep hole. Yeah, especially in rocky ground. Yeah, like I, we live in the Rockies. Like we might not even get three feet deep in some places. Right. If you live out in the, in the Midwest, you've got a better chance. But like if, Florida, you dig too deep, you're going to be underwater. Like there, there's there's some realities here you got to think about where you live. You got to look at what works best for where you live. Mm -hmm. um, when when pioneers were crossing the plains, coming to Utah, and when people were following the Oregon Trail, a lot of times what they do is they would simply 
they couldn't dig deep enough. And so they'd simply put rocks over the body so that the animals wouldn't really get to it. And that was more for respect for the dead than anything else. Because you but, don't want the animals digging them up. So you got to get at least underneath you know, a little bit of uh, dirt between them and that and, and the surface so that you don't have that. I mean, I, that's a huge issue for respect, especially if we, yeah. you know, those of us that believe in the resurrection, we got to be able to, <laughs> I mean, God's all powerful and he'll be able to find whatever uh, body parts or you know, wherever they are, but and get them back together. But what was Adam made out of? The earth itself. Dirt. Yeah. God made dirt, dirt don't hurt. Exactly. Unto <laughs> dust, the, dust thou art and unto dust shalt thou become. Right. And yeah. so it's okay. So the big reason why we're talking about this tonight amongst other things in the, in the world of hygiene is what if that body that you have to dispose of has a virus? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, we look at all the movies, there's zombie apocalypse scenarios. Like there's, there's bacteria. There's different movies have different theories and, and things could happen. But like, if there is an actual plague going on, you have to figure out what am I going to do? to take care of this. One of the biggest unsolved pro things that I came across this is fascinating. When everyone all of a sudden realized, okay, the U S has nukes, they start all the different countries. And this is, I was reading this about Britain, great Britain, all the different countries were like, okay, we need to figure out a plan for what if one of these nukes go off, what can we do to take care of the people that survive? And 20 years later, someone said, how can we never had a plan for all the dead? Because statistically, and in their scenario, they were like, they estimated over a million dead if they had a nuke in one of their major city points. And they never had a plan for what do we do for those bodies? Because mm -hmm. they could be radioactive. They're like, there's so many different things. And they're like, there was no plan. So the government, yet again, didn't have a plan for the people. So you, as, as uh, the head of your household, You've got to start thinking about these things. What is your plan? What are you going to do in those scenarios? We're also going to talk about composting and some other fun stuff and, and hygiene. But I wanted to bring that up first because that's the that's the biggest problem. Well, I read the book the one second after, and several of you have probably read books about surviving and whether it's civil unrest, whether it's a, an attack, an invasion from other countries, whether it's an EMP and we lose the grid for months on end. And frankly, we just had an episode on EMPs. And if the grid goes down, you're, I mean, realistically, it, if the full grid goes down, you're realistically looking at six months to a year, maybe longer before you're going to get that thing back up and running. And there's going to be people that are, are alive today because of life support. They're alive today because of medicine they're alive today because of these things and if that's not available because the, the shipments aren't coming because the cars are stalled because or whatever the reason is people are going to start dropping off the statistically most people don't have enough food to survive for longer than a few days or a week um, they don't have medicines for sure to last longer than a couple months or a month even and so if you have a really serious scenario where it's a month or two or three in we're going to have people you know, you're going to in neighborhoods and communities will have to band together to survive. Mm -hmm. And so you might have a local hospital that's now, what do you do with all those people? You might, maybe the, the, the person next door was on life support or some kind of support on oxygen machines and, and they didn't have a pre prepare properly or you ran out of whatever. You're going to have to deal with these bodies. You're going to have to figure out what to do and how to dispose of it because the, the number one killer after not having enough food is hygiene and disease and infections and uh, that we we might be able to get and even if the person doesn't have a virus but they just die and decompose that's going to attract all kinds of <laughs> stuff you don't want to have and so you're going to have to find a way to dispose of it properly and who has enough wood or enough uh, tools quickly to build a couple hundred coffins nobody unfortunately and so in the book that I read, the one second after book, they actually had to, they would, they would try to be as respectful as, as possible with the dead and bury them singularly. But sometimes there was too many and they had to have several of them in one, one big grave. Yeah, so pit. it's not something that we want to think about because it's kind of, you know, we love these people, but at the same time, we have to remember that, Hey, this is a reality. Death is a reality of life. 
Well, I think the the first plan, my my first thought was that, um, especially at first, depending on how long this uh, emergency happened goes goes on, is just stick with the standard uh, um, cemetery. Uh, community cemetery right for the, the city the cities typically run the cemeteries at least where i live uh go with uh, the the standard plans work with the city work with the community and uh i guess it depends on the scale of everything that happens obviously but uh, i think that that's probably my first thought my first plan is that just go with the your standard plans you should probably i i'm getting older i should probably already buy a plot right i don't know if i'm that old yet but I already have those those plots purchased and arranged for, it, and then it, I think it'd be a lot more simple uh, when it comes. So I'm just planning on never dying. So, well, that's do, what do my, that as you may. my my but, daughter was just telling me that earlier. You're, you're not going to die, right? She says, "No, nah, I'm not planning on it." So, okay, just spread the word. Spread the okay, word. And, and this is knows. this is part of this question, um, Kimberly. <clears throat> thank you for posting this question. Not to mention, or statement not to mention all the animals that die as well right here here's a great resource i found um and you can google this but it's it i searched all across the united states um was had a hard time finding like the u.s plan for bodies um but i found canada had a lot of great resources uh northwest territories health and social services has actual guidelines of what to do based on what is going on with that person. Um, so they actually have like infectious diseases, like high risk areas. Mm -hmm. Okay. Very high risk, high risk, moderate risk, and, and medium risk, low risk, like where body bags required versus not required. Um, for example, high risk or very high risk scenarios applies to cases where there's anthrax, there's Lassa, Ebola, Marburg, um, yellow fever, a plague, rabies, rabies, right? Mm -hmm. SARS, uh, septicemia that where they didn't have a streptococcal infection, or I mean that they did have a streptococcal infection and had less than 24 hours of appropriate antibiotic therapy. Go back and get your antibiotics, guys. Where do we do that? Jace Medical. Paris talked about it at the beginning of the hour. Use code Prepper Talk. Save 10, 10 bucks. But something that could be avoided, right? But that that falls into the very high risk. Like you need to be careful how you dispose these bodies, mm -hmm. right? If you've got body bags, great. I'm sure you could probably find them on Amazon. I don't know. I, 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 we should probably delete that that line. I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't know. I've never thought about getting a body bag. But like those are cases where you've got to, when you're done, if you have to take care of those, you've got to make sure you've got masks on, gloves on. You don't try to clean the bodies. You don't try to do anything special and nice for those bodies. You have to remove those bodies and get them away from the living as hygienically as possible. So right. you're saying I should add lie to my preps. Fantastic idea. <laughs> right. Just be careful doing searches for how to dispose of a dead body on Google right now. You might have a knock on the door from a government agency. There, there are no body bags available on Amazon. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> Okay, I'm glad you checked. But like, okay, <laughs> but check. having lie or having access to lie, like those are things that will dispose of a body and also kill and eliminate most infections, right? That are already there, not on a live person, but on a dead person. But other things like high risks, some that has hepatitis or HIV, AIDS. You know, there's so many different things that you could. If someone has those things, you've got to be concerned with how you dispose of those those bodies in a post disaster scenario. Pre-disaster scenario, absolutely go through the hospitals, go through regular channels. Don't ever try to do this on your own. But the same thing applies. Like if there's if there's if you've got a dog that gets rabies and you have to put it down, you've got to keep that away from your you, your kids, and all the other animals around you. You've got to have precautions. You've got to take precautions. And and so if you're using a shovel, shovel to dig it up or dig up an area and you put the animal there and then you use the shovel to put stuff back, disinfect that shovel or yeah. get rid of it, right? Have backups to backups to backups. And I can't tell you how good it is in so many cases to not burn the, the bodies because a lot of times those things are going to outlast that fire. And the fire's not going to get everything. And it's not going to so, smell very good either. It's not going to smell good. Actually, I actually just watched a uh, 
video the other day of a lady who lived next to a crematorium, didn't know it was a crematorium. Mm-hmm. And she was asking, why is the smell? Why does that place open up on the weekends and do barbecue only? It smells delicious. Wow. That's messed up. Well, I think it has something to do with how how high the temperature is in a crematorium, sure. rather, versus an open fire, which would, uh, you know, kind of makes me think of the the old uh, Native American movies, right? Where, where or or the uh, old Viking movies where they send the uh, the dead out on a raft on a, on a lake or out on the ocean or and something. Light it on fire. Light it on fire out there, but and I guess that's an option as well. Uh, but uh, you're going to contaminate water sources that way. <laughs> regardless mm-hmm. of, i guess we how somehow you survived look at us now we are, we're yeah like, mankind survived uh we're just doing it the primitive way yeah so, burial grounds too it's like you know there's in the ground and there's several burial grounds where you see that at least i i've never visited them myself but i've seen in the tv where they build them on they bury them up they, mm-hmm. they build mm-hmm. on stilts or um they have them up up above the ground as well so there's there's just lots of things. And back in ancient Israel, they did uh, in tombs and they built in caves. Mm-hmm. They tried to cover them up as much as they could too, as well as we know. But um, you've got to find a way that's far away. So if let's say your your city is, um, is your, you know, you don't have a cemetery nearby, you're going to have to wait to transport the bodies too, which is something that you may not think about, like a, some kind of a wagon or trailer or something where you can take them because you're not going to want to bury them in, in your backyard or in nearby. You want to take them far far away, kind of outside the city limits or to a place that's maybe already designated, like Shane said, to a cemetery that's already in play that you can just fill up. And then from there, if that gets too bad, unfortunately, um, that gets filled up, then you're going to have to find a new place. And hopefully that's far away because you don't want to have that contaminating the rivers the streams, your water sources for sure. I mean, if you, if, I remember as a boy scout, it was like, don't go to the, don't go number one or go to the bathroom within a hundred feet of a river. Well, if you buried somebody within that, it's probably even worse. So definitely want to make sure that you're keeping everything outside of the limits of where you're going to have a community or society, just keep it on the outskirts and then have ways to transport that stuff so that you're, um, you're taking care of it. And then cleaning, Lots of good cleaning supplies, disinfectants, etc. Yeah, you I think it help. would make sense uh, putting together a kit right now with a Tyvek suit with some some uh, nitro gloves and and so forth that that you can put on and you can dispose of very quickly. Um, I've got a bunch of those kits myself. Yeah. What were those called again, Scott? What were those kits called? Um, well, there's the ones that we could get that used to be from a yeah from gone, but yeah. uh, um, I forget what they are. It's kind of an HVAC, not HVAC, uh, hygiene kits, basically. Hazard? Is it a hazard kit? Hazardous hygiene kits. But basically, hazmat it's got a full mask, gloves, yeah, and, kind of like and, a, and a nice little body covering. You look like a big white blob, a, a Stay Puft Marshmallow Man. But I've got some of those. Then I bought some uh, elsewhere and put some put kits together for the whole family um, just in case you have to deal with something because you don't want to reuse those once you've used one. Right. So I've got multiples. Um, right. But yeah, moving off the topic of, of bodies, let's talk about the topic of human waste. Right. We are garbage dumps. We are dumpster fires of toxic garbage coming out of our bodies. Mm-hmm. And I've wondered why is that? The, like you go, you go hiking and camping and you see, you see like deer poo everywhere. Right. You see <laughs> bear poo and, and, bobcat, and-, cat and everything everywhere. Right. And it's not toxic. It's dirty, and it's there's germs, but it's not like toxic like ours. What is wrong with us? Just all the garbage in, garbage out, man. And for, well, for I don't, I don't know. There's, I mean, that's part of it. Yeah, absolutely, Paris. But I, I don't know. There's much of a difference other than um, the theirs is placed directly in the sunlight, right? Which is disinfects and kills bacteria, and you know UVAB rays. Uh, which we know purifies water. Uh, so I think that has to do with part of it, right? And and it's not being concentrated in one area. It's spread out quite a bit, you know, just like grazing animals, right? Uh, why are we then grabbing all the cow the poo? But then you grab all the cow poo and you rub it all over your garden. That's that's true. It makes for great, uh, great fertilizer. But it's already, been, like I say, it's already been sanitized by the sun, right? Thank you. I'm glad you're so smart because <laughs> I was going to tell people that, but I'm like, you've, studied it more than i have but it's just like yeah some of the best 
some of the best things you could put on your garden are from your chickens, your rabbits, your, your cows, right? But you got to let it sit out in the sun first. Mm -hmm. And we know that municipalities actually do that as well. They take the human waste, they spread it out, they dry it, they turn it over, they compost it, and some will actually sell it. Uh, I don't think that's a good idea. I think there are plenty of reports uh, where it actually is, is harmful, but it is used for compost and used for fertilizer in some locales. I, don't, I couldn't tell you where, but uh, I believe uh, Health Ranger, he's done a whole whole story on that. So I would avoid that if possible, but to, Hey, if the Martian did it, you know, did it, Matt Damon did it on the Martian, you know, it's, it's, it's doable, right? As long as, you know, like you say, parents, you know, what's going in, you know, what's coming out. Right. So I was just about to talk about that. <laughs> I'm so glad you stole my thunder. <coughs> yeah. So, yeah, terrible. So maybe we shouldn't be too terribly concerned, but have a plan, right. How to deal with it. And it's, it can be, overwhelming maybe at first but once you have a plan i don't think it's that big a deal unless you have seven people in the house like me right that's a, yeah. a lot of bathrooms a lot of a uh, lot of waste to deal well, with. well you know when you got a when you got a cow that eats grass it's literally net <laughs> right it com what comes in comes out and it just comes out a little different uh and so that's mm -hmm. where it's better but when we eat processed foods and food from a box and we eat all these stuff. I mean, when you read the label and you can't even pronounce it, 40. that's going out the other end and that's going to go back into our landfills and, and into your uh, yard or into your dirt. And that's, I don't think you can grow vegetables on um, yellow number five. So, you know, that's yellow. why we're not going to make sure you're eating good foods, people like that's one thing I've actually, in the last <laughs> little while here, I've been studying ways that I can eat more effectively and, and I'm, trying hard to get rid of sugar so much sugar in my diet because it's i think the inflammation is killing me but you know what you put in is what will come out so if you want to have um, a healthier digestive system you need to put the right input in and um, that will keep you healthy and keep you flowing properly yeah, well, let's talk about how to deal with that real quick here, because it's not not all that simple. Obviously, at first it could be simple. Uh, say we run out of power, we don't have power, uh, but we still have water. Your, your toilets can still flush, right? Uh, depending on where you live, if you're on a hill, things flow downhill. If you're in a low spot and and your community uses a uh, a pump station to move the waste from your home to the treatment plant, those are things you need to know. You need to know. You know, if if it's just all your system's all gravity and it's going straight to the 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 uh, the waste uh, treatment center, uh, or if it has to go by a pump, and if the power's out, is that pump going to function? Are they going to have backup uh, power for that pump? Uh, and can you continue to use your toilets, or will it back up and contaminate your home? And we've talked about this before, but um, you know, part of our water storage and or uh, the secondary use of our water storage after it's washed dishes is to fill toilets and, and flush toilets. Um, obviously, you know, water is extremely important for sanitation. And uh, and that is, we've talked about many times, is the hardest, one of the hardest things that we to prepare for is to have enough water to, to drink, let alone uh, for sanitation and washing yourself and your dishes and your and staying clean. Yeah, I think it's important to have to remember too that if you're going to have a waste you're going to need to have a place specifically for that so that it's quarantined a little bit that you're not going to be you know having a uh, you know free for all in your backyard but find a place that you can quarantine that that's just designed for that and try to i mean i don't know about digging a six foot hole but you know for certain waste you want to get it as deep and wide as you can so that you can especially if it's going to be long term you want to you want to be able to have a place where you can bury that and uh, keep it um, from contaminating the rest of your, or even being in the open air. Cause you know, you get feces and other things in the open air and you start collecting bugs and other flies and, and um, just different yeah. insects like that. You're going to have germs and disease. that's going to travel way faster and more readily. So you want to get it underground, buried, put it in a sack bag. They have great, uh, I was just at the survival store just this last week and they had, um, bag baggies that you can, you, I don't know if you've seen them 
where they have like a five gallon bucket where you can put a, a toilet seat on it, but then they have like the bags that you can mm -hmm. defecate into. And then those bags can be sealed and then you can bury those bags. So they're kind of expensive, but I think it's in, and at least to begin with, get as many as you can. And then at least you have that to start with. And if those run out, you know, you're going to have to dig a hole in the backyard somewhere or, and, and do it that way. Yeah. And, and there is also uh, a method to, uh, dig your own septic system um, using a drum, you know, 55 gallon barrel. There's a way to create your own underground septic system with a drain field uh, for a little bit longer term use. Uh, of course, you have to have the right ground, right location, and so forth. But there's there's ways to deal with it. Scott, I inter interrupted you. No, you're right. Same <coughs> thing. Um, it's funny because it's like if you have a large family. There's a lot of benefits to that because you have a lot of workers available to help get through mm -hmm. a scenario. But you have a few challenges, right? Ger germs, more prevalent. Um, bacteria issues. You've got to have disinfectants on hand. You've got to have a better plan for your, your bathroom, right? Digging a latrine in the backyard and, and even creating a complete septic system. It does take time, but it's, it's a fantastic long-term solution. Yeah, and of course, you know, more than just... Um, than just uh, the nasty stuff. I don't want to. I don't want to say it. I don't want to say is it. is just our garbage. How do we deal with garbage? Right. That uh, you know uh, today's garbage day. I had three full garbage cans. Well, one was our green waste, right? The leaves, mm -hmm. but uh, whole entire can full of recycle cycling and an entire can full of garbage. Uh, how do you deal with that when the the services are not available? What uh, well, and those are engineered services too. Mm -hmm. Right. They've created these services to make us think we live in this really wonderful way. But in reality, it's creating a bigger problem when things go sideways. Mm -hmm. Whereas the old school septic systems were what you'd have for your house. You had in, in your house, you have a septic system. And in the neighbor's house, they have their septic system. And in the other neighbor's house, they have their septic system. And they all are independent of each other. And if one goes down not everybody is in trouble right but the same thing goes for you know you can do composting toilets uh, you can do but but the other part of it is is like okay what kind of disinfectants can you create on the fly post shtf right i take everything that's compostable like the green waste and i and i throw that into the garden that i can now right i i hardly hardly get rid of any of that it all goes on compost piles and i get rid of it that that way and let it become fertilizer but yeah, the other well, thing is it's like disinfecting and keeping the the bur the germs and the bugs at bay right it doesn't take much to make your own disinfectant mm -hmm. all you need is a half cup of vinegar two cups of water and then you can drop some essential oils in there Right. And, or you can take as well. the peel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What's that? It's salt as well. Salt. Yeah. Baking right? soda. It, baking baking soda, soda. Right. There's so many different ways you can make it, but it doesn't take much. You can even take orange peels and drop them in your vinegar and let it sit for a, a week. And then after a week, you use that vinegar to be put into your, your recipe. Right. And now you, you have all these other benefits, but it doesn't take much. You just have to have those things printed out and start practicing those things now yeah. so that when shdf happens and things go sideways and you're like oh crap how do i i can't get disinfectant from the store walmart's closed just like everybody else what do i do mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Preppers, right and so so here's a list of words that i recommend you write down uh that will help help you deal with your waste right reuse reduce recycle repurpose compost burn bury I think that covers it all. Please list any more if I missed any. But yeah, there's some comments about about composting. Anything that was formerly alive, anything that was alive, you can compost. Cardboard, you can compost cardboard, and it, put it back into your into your system, into your garden, right? So uh, obviously, if everything uh, when everything goes down, we can't go to the store. We're obviously going to have less trash. Uh, you know, cardboard for me is going to be a fire starter. We're going to save that. We're going to set that aside. And, uh, you know, if you think of the saying, one man's trash is another man's treasure. 
I mean, if you can work with your community as well, things that they might be throwing away could be helpful to someone else. So I think there's a lot of things yeah. that take some planning and some thinking that you can recycle and reuse and obviously reduce. We're going to, you know, that's going to be reduced our, our amount of trash because we're just going to have less. We're going to be able to buy less. I think uh, a lot of the disposable, the a lot of disposable yeah. go away, like paper plates, paper bowls. I think more yeah. people will go back to washing their stuff and keeping it like that. Another thing Absolutely. I did, I don't, I don't know if this is something that you guys have thought about for your preps, but something that I thought about for sanitation was um, just having a couple boxes of kitty litter. Uh, that mm -hmm. really helps with the smell. I mean, I, of course, only a couple of boxes will only last me a couple of days or weeks, you know, at a couple of weeks at the most, yeah. not a, necessarily a great long-term uh, product, but short-term that can keep your stuff um, from spreading in the smell. Well, when, when people are at the store and they're trying to get all the milk and the bread, you're over there getting kitty litter, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're like, what does that guy know that we don't know? Well, you exactly. Know. Exactly. I just don't want to picture anybody squatting over that. You know, you put it, you do your business and then you dump it over. So just yeah, yeah, sprinkling yeah. it on, use a buffer. Yeah. I got a bucket use that as part of you, you're sprinkling on. You can use, you can use ash. You can use uh, sawdust. There's a lot of things you can do to, to cover up layers in your five gallon waste bucket see my first yeah. th thought was my little five-year-old well he's four he'll be five soon but he he would see the kitty litter and try to be a cat and i'm like no 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 no, no. and so i'm sure a listener out there is going kitty litter am i supposed kitty to squat litter. over that no nope. no nope. <laughs> No, you want to, I guess. You, but... you do your business and then you spread that over the top of it so that you got you can keep it contained. It's a great way to. I mean, I was surprised when I used it on a camping trip in a tent that I made specifically as an outhouse. Um, I, one of those stand up shower tents, anyways. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I was literally surprised I couldn't smell, um, standing right there. I mean, I'm, I was sure that I was going to open up that thing and just be just be knocked over by the stench mm -hmm. and it wasn't there because the kitty litter kept it uh, kept it in and kept the bugs and the yeah. flies didn't even flies didn't weren't even on it so it kept it sanitized at a very high level uh i'm sure long term eventually stuff would find it but in the meantime it was it was protected and and so i you know i just i agree with you shane like what do we do with all of our regular waste it's just we're gonna have to be more um recycling we're gonna have to be more thoughtful about it and we can't just put it in a trash can and set it out on the street and hope it goes away every week because it's not going to be there. We yeah. got to do that ourselves. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or or another thought was arranged with the community that someone who has a trailer can collect garbage and take it down to the dump. I mean, I think that's an option. Maybe at first, I don't know how long that would work, if that's even a possibility. But I think that's something to look into. But also, you know, thinking about we're talking about disinfectants as well. Uh, we use the disinfectant we use most is actually it's a vinegar salt solution that's electrolyzed, yeah. uh, kind of like how I make colloidal silver using uh, four nine silver and creating my own. Uh, I don't even know what to call it, uh, anode cathode and and breaking that down and creating my own uh, uh, colloidal silver as a sanitizer. I can you can drink it, you can add it to to water uh, and I use that vinegar salt to create an electrolyzed solution as well which works great for cleaning uh but but yeah uh don't forget about silver it's just silver coins you think about how silverware actually used to be made of silver and that was for a reason our ancestors knew what they were talking about uh they would put silver coins in barrels of water to help keep them help keep them clean and eat with silverware because the silver bacteria cannot grow on silver or copper uh, so by having some silver on hand just for that to throw it in your your water containers or um, create be able to create your own colloidal silver or, or ionic yeah. silver is actually really what it is not colloidal but uh, there's there's a number of things you can do and of course we talk about pool shock all the time yep pool shock is one of my favorites uh, it's such a great great tool to have around it doesn't take much space and you can store a ton of it and it's a great disinfectant um and you can even use it to help you know purify your water like obviously get your recipes printed out keep, mm -hmm. you know or if you're doing it frequently you remember exactly the ratios i've got all the ratios in my binders so i don't have to like store it all up here because up here is not that smart but i've got everything stored all over the place but everyone reminder 
everyone should have binders and and printed copies of things to help keep organized and stored. Mm -hmm. Because There's that's no what's going to help you There's when no the internet's saying, down and you can't Google it. You need to be able to to binder it and find it. Yeah, I was going to say one of the greatest things I had uh, someone tell me for a long time ago was the the dullest pencil is better than the sharpest mind. Hmm. And you got to take notes. You got to write things hmm. down because at some point you're going to forget and you need to have it written down somewhere that's referenceable. I mean, shoot, if you've got a bunch of yellow pads stacked up somewhere, that's not going to, it's not very helpful. So put it in a place that, you know, you can get back to organized and ready to go. And I think, um, yeah, I don't, Scott, you tell us is, is what you just shared that, that binder that you have, uh, with those ratios, is that one of the resources that we have on our resources tab on our website? Uh, it's not, um, maybe, but yeah, I've got, I mean, here's one of my binders. Here's another one of my binders. This is my rework in progress travel binder. Um, but this one I carry in my in my truck usually in my car. This goes with my get home bag um, because it has resources and little baby step stuff. Easy to use. I've got first aid in here. I've got identifying wild wild edibles and medicinal things like this is this goes with me right and then i have a huge library of things books as well as binders that stay here at the house so that we have our own library it's amazing having your mm -hmm. own library and your own binders like keeps things organized like because you're not going to be able to youtube things and be like oh how do i do this again and if you have drawings that explain it and the written plans like uh, let me show you this. This one's pretty good. I've got a section on my travel one that has how to do all these different snares with written instructions. So if I forget how to do it, I can I can do it again. I can, I can oh yeah, what's my resource? Okay, because I'll be honest, I used to be really good at snares, but it's been about five years since I built one. Wow. So I need to get practicing again. But I also have tracking and game identification guides in here for my travel one. I live in an area that has a lot of different um, rodents, a lot of different small game, um, rabbits, deer. Like There's all kinds of stuff. So I need to I'd be able to identify those things. And this is so light. This is less than two pounds. And look, it says ready binder. Nice. And it's flimsy. You don't want the cardboard backed ones because those aren't flimsy. I can just shove this around stuff in my bag. You know, I wonder nowadays how many people actually own printers, right? Um, I think not as many as, I mean, I'm, I'm still old school. So obviously I have a printer, uh, but uh, I, I think a lot of people actually don't have printers. So I might be a good prep, go spend 50 bucks, 100 bucks on a printer and some ink cool. and some paper and, and uh, start printing these things out you see on, online. Most libraries, public libraries, will allow you to print up to 30 pages a day for free. Really? Okay. Mm -hmm. So find out what your library allows you to do and go read, go get registered, get on their computer, and do your searches for the things you need from home, home, right? Send yourself an email with all the hyperlinks of the things you want to print off that week at the library. Then go down to the library and print them off. And some libraries are like, I, I was at one library and there were 10 pages a day. But I'm wow. like, that's that's still better than none. Mm -hmm. That is a, a good I idea if you the, don't own a printer. One of the most important things to do, I think, is is become. This is off our topic of hygiene, but become problem solving. Like, get to the point where you're always thinking of free solutions and passive solutions, right? become a passive prepper, meaning you've got all these passive solutions working for you that either you're not paying for, you're not physically having to do it. Like for example, a gravity water filter, you put the water in the top and then the water filter does all the work for you. You're not having to pump it. You're not having like something simple like that. It's a passive prep. You've got mm -hmm. water catchment coming in. It goes to an upper tank. The upper tank then pours it through the water filtration. Water filtration puts it into a clean tank. Right. 
and you have valves, you can turn it on and off. Like that's passive, right? A garden is a semi-passive prep. A orchard is a very passive prep. It takes a lot less work to maintain an orchard. So looking at different solutions, one of the really good passive preps, septic system. Since we're talking about this topic, septic systems, building your own septic tank and system. It's not something you have to worry about every day. You don't have to do anything for it every day. Mm -hmm. You just need water in and it takes care of the water out and the waste out. Yeah. I don't know what these, um, there's a lot of those permanent, like when I go on a trail, for example, I was, we were, our family went to, his, uh, to go hike in this trail and there was a permanent structure that was a bathroom. And I know that they, maybe they pump stuff out, but I know that they, they put stuff into that as well to help it break down. Mm -hmm. I don't know what that would be, what that chemical is, but they put stuff in there to break it down so that it's easier to uh, pump out. And we, you know, if the grid's down and things are not going the right way we want for a longer period of time, we may not be able to have the ability to pump out a, of a hole out of our backyard, but at least we can put chemicals in there to break down um, the feces, break down the stuff that we're putting in there. Um, because that's going to be something that's important. I, you know, I, I hate to say this, but I don't like the idea of having reusable toilet paper or, um, you know, ways to cleaning, cleaning yourself. But I think that's something that we should, uh, touch on for a minute. I think that there's, you know, how, there was a run, what was the, <laughs> the big toilet paper shortage of 2020, right? Mm -hmm. Well, imagine long-term the, there's not going to be toilet paper nobody's going to be making it there's there's no good no new shipments of toilet paper coming to the local grocery store so what are you going to do to clean yourself you're going to have to either find a way to do some kind of makeshift bidet or you're going to have to have cloth um okay. cleaning supplies here here's your here's your one tool to solve your bidet problem for the whole family you know those big like three gallon or two gallon bug spray containers you can go buy at Home Depot or in Lowe's. Mm -hmm. You can also use them for mm -hmm. fertilized spray, right? Mm -hmm. You buy one of those and you fill that with water. That is a homemade bidet because mm -hmm. you can pump air into it to pressurize it. And then all you do is you hold the trigger and aim at your butt crack. Better yet, better yet, Scott, find a metal one and you can heat the water up directly in that metal one and use it for a shower as well. True. You can also, if you have the plastic wand one, you can also carefully, slowly heat the plastic wand and bend it up. Uh -huh. So it's easier to hit the target. <laughs> Bullseye. <laughs> yeah. <See? laughs> I did that one as the test. It worked really well until I broke it. Um, I put it in the garage and accidentally dropped some other stuff on it. Oh, dang. I got to make another one. But it was, it was great. It was a great little resource. I heard about somebody doing it. And I was like, I'm going to try mm -hmm. that. So... If you go through my garage right now, you'll find little random prepping projects that I started and either finished or I abandoned or they got broke and I've got it there to remind me to build a new one. Um, but yeah, I've got my wife's like, you need to go through that and get rid of what's broken. Like, you tell Mike says uh, you could use a big leaf. <laughs> Absolutely. To, uh, wipe. Uh, just make sure it's not poison oak. It, exactly. Here's the tip. If it's shiny, if it's shiny, don't probably don't want to use it, right? Uh, but uh, the the mullen, the woolly mullen leaves, you've seen those big yep. furry leaves? Those those work very well. Those are called you, woolly mullen? Yeah. Well, or flannel leaf mullen or woolly mullen, yeah. With the the, called the mullen tone in your or, voice or uh, leads me to believe you've tried it in real life, Shane. <laughs> no comment. I've tried them. <laughs> mullen, mullen works great. Or it's nice and fluffy thick, butt wipe or whatever you want. Soft. Yeah. <laughs> don't don't try to wipe too hard though, because they will tear, just like regular toilet paper. Lamb's ears, yeah. Lamb ears, uh, another, another slightly different plant. There you go. Mm -hmm. So definitely having your preps, uh, some kind of method to clean yourself after you've uh, defecated in, because uh, toilet paper number one, toilet paper is going to fill up your hole in the backyard much quicker with, uh, and so it's going to give you less room to continue to do your business. Um, but the, it's going to run out as well. Like if you're long-term, I think I probably have enough toilet paper for my family for, for 90 days. And, um, after that, I bet that's one of the, that's going to be one of the first things to go at, at this grocery store. If it's a long-term issue, 
is toilet paper. We already saw that. We already know hey, that. So, here's something I heard about a long time when I was a kid, that the military were only allotted one sheet of toilet paper per use. There's actually a video here on YouTube, how to use one sheet of toilet paper. The military to the way to use toilet paper. So I <laughs> recommend go check that out. Well, so Because in my house, man, we go through so much toilet paper. Holy here's the cow. Thing too. If your poop's coming out dry and hard and not messy... It's a lot easier to wipe once and be clean. If you're eating well, then you have, it comes out yeah, well. Good, good fiber. <laughs> Make sure you got good fiber in your diet. Well, what's interesting, there's also like, you can actually go buy, like they, they call them like unpaper rolls. Have you guys heard of these? Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Um, basically they're cloth toilet paper. And you can buy um, a disinfectant solution that you basically, one, one of the people that I've followed, they took and they created five, wipes for each person in the family and it's just these little um silver cloths um, when i say silver there's like they're silver infused so they're mm -hmm. antibacterial to begin with but then they'll each family member gets five cloths they're all one color for each family member so like i would get blue one person would get all the green one person right and then when they're used one they dump it into this other bit, little bin once it's they're done with it they dump it into a bin with the sanitizer and it sits in there and disinfects and then they go wash them every couple of days as needed and that's if you really want the wipe sensation for the rest of eternity that's what you use is something like that hmm. i'm kind gonna of like uh the kids diapers day. like the old cloth diapers how you yeah. would uh yeah i remember that my 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 mother uh, used cloth diapers for on us i believe and some of the younger kids so and you bring up yeah, a great point, Jane. There's going to be, if, if we're running out of toilet paper, I promise we're going to run out of diapers. So if you've got little ones running yeah. around and mm -hmm. um, you're getting, definitely going to want to have something cloth diaper related to um, to contain anything that happens. Yeah. So, so Paris, you were saying uh, about the, when you're hiking in those, uh, those toilets, they are what's called the vault toilet. And it is, uh, it just contains and then it's, it's pumped out. But there are septic tank treatments, which are a bacteria that helps to dissolve. Kind of the same thing that the uh, the uh, uh, <clears throat> city uh, or the uh, septic treatment or the uh, water treatment plants use to break down the bacteria, uh, break down the waste, so that it's uh, easier to deal with. And, and I don't know if that works in vault toilets, but it, it definitely works in septic systems. Yep. And I agree with whited outdoors, by the way. I mean, yeah, two wipes. It, it may only take one wipe to be clean, but it takes two wipes to know that you only needed one. That's <laughs> Amen, right, brother. Amen. That's right. Uh, great see, that's why we like having people on our show when we do the live to make comments uh, like that and keep us, uh, yeah, you know, stuff that we don't even we don't remember to say or talk about. Somebody will make a comment. It's like, hey, that's legit. That's that needs to be shared. That I just don't want to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Oh, that's awesome. So when 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 SHTF happens, you've got to deal with your SH, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. get your plan again. Get your plan ready. Get your tools ready now. Get your solutions ready now. Make sure the whole family is aware of them, and practice them for a weekend. Turn off all your power. See how life changes. Mm -hmm. Okay, can I keep things disinfected? Okay, is my you know maybe don't turn off the power to your freezer for the weekend. Just don't need to test some things but turn off the power to the main house where everyone's learning to do things a different way yep you know also, or just go camping i think another thing to remember is that we're not as um fragile as we are led to believe uh we don't need antibacterials every five seconds you know back in the day true what so did, true what did, what did the Indians who lived for thousands of years uh, on this continent do? I mean, they didn't mm -hmm. have disinfectant after every single thing they ever did. And they survived. And, and I mean, sure, there was disease. Sure, there's life expectancy. Okay, there's things to, to, to consider. But also realize they lived many years without having a lot of the, these crazy things that everybody thinks tells us we need to have. So um, you guys have any final thoughts before we wrap it up? No, I think you're exactly right, Paris. I think uh, maybe we are overthinking this. Uh, and that it will be a lot more simple, but, uh, but you're absolutely right. Uh, I, I think it's nothing to worry too much about, but just work on getting prepared. Amen. Cool. Well, thanks again, guys, for listening. You've been listening to Prepper Talk Radio, Radio for the Ready Minded. Uh, take time to plan, 
take the time necessary to write out your plans, to discuss your plans, to plan for your plans, and then you'll be ready when stuff hits the fan and you you already had the plans. Uh, for those of you listening on the live, I hope you have a great Thanksgiving. Uh, it's the day before on the live. For those of you who are listening afterwards, we hope that you had a great Thanksgiving and look forward to the holidays uh, coming up as well. So please stay ready. Please be ready-minded always and in all things. And and for goodness sakes, be solutions oriented in your life, in all things in your life. So thanks again for listening to Prepper Talk Radio. Have a great day and we'll see you on the next one. See you next week. See you guys.